Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cent segment. I'm Pete Wargent and I'm joined by Chris Bates as usual. Chris, how's things? Pete, life's good, mate. Um, how are you doing? It's a um, lot, lot's been happening here. I guess uh, just the usual family time and, um, you know, getting uh, ready for Christmas, I guess. We've uh, got a big Christmas party for the team and, yeah, a couple of months of head down bum up still here. What's going on there? I'm back at work, been back away this week. Yes, had a, a week up at the Great Barrier Reef, as you'd remember from last week. But yeah, back to it uh, this week. And yeah, as you mentioned, we've got Halloween coming up, then my birthday, got my son's birthday, bonfire night. Yeah, it's all happening. So uh, <laughs> not much downtime. And as you said, scarily, uh, the shops are starting to kit things out for Christmas already. So um, yeah, that'll be coming around before we know it. And uh, yeah, the, the housing market starts shutting down anyway in December. So uh yeah, there's not too long to go now. We're into the home stretch. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I was just chatting to a friend who's an agent, um, taught us swimming lessons the other day, actually. And, um, yeah, he's saying there's a lot coming on. I mean, it's up in the beaches, but, you know, that uh, likely they're going to go all the way through to Christmas, where sometimes they, they sort of back it off, you know, in November. He seems to think that there's still going to be a good run of people wanting to sell prior to Christmas. So it's going to be interesting to see if it's a bit of a later spring i feel like it sprung a bit earlier this year's listings came on earlier than they usually do but maybe they're going to continue to come onto the market all the way up through to christmas not die off in november be time will tell i guess it's been such an unusual two or three years that a lot of the seasonal trends have been thrown out of kilter anyway not yeah. just in the property market just in all kinds of indicators and parts of the economy so yeah it wouldn't be at all surprising if this this uh, year proves to be a bit unusual just because everything has been unusual uh, for such a long time now so um yeah and uh, how's work are you are you guys still busy are you still uh getting uh, new clients through the door refinancing yeah i mean um definitely purchases have uh, increased dramatically in the last you know month or so so people are willing to take action um i think refinancing is really quite tough at the moment bank retention pricing is really good so if you're at a bank and you um you want a better rate just basically ask them and they'll probably look after you which is you know, completely different to what they were like a couple of years ago. They would say, uh, no, we'll give you a five basis points to, to kind of shut you up, but you're going to have to refinance if you want a better deal. And they just gamble that you wouldn't refinance, which most people didn't. But banks know that people are, um, you know, willing to refinance. There's been more refinancing in the last two or three years and, you know, uh, way above longer term trends as a percentage of loan books. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, harder to refinance now because you might as well just stay your existing bank because they're looking after you, which is totally fine for uh, for us. I mean, and um, yeah, it's, it's. I think it's going to be interesting to see how people purchase over the next couple of months because as prices move, their borrowing capacities aren't able to move as well. So a lot of people are already stretching their borrowing capacity and we've had clients that have been pushed out of markets because they've thought what well, was possible three, six months ago isn't possible today. And that's dangerous when you're a buyer because once you get forced out of a market, you have to go and explore a new market and it takes you some time to get up to speed on that market. You know, where do we really want to be? You know, what streets, what part of the suburbs, how's that going to work for work, you know? Um, and then by the time you get out all that knowledge, that market's moved and then, you know, you miss out in that market, et cetera, like that. So when markets are rising faster than people are expecting and borrowing capacities aren't available, then, you're going to find this disillusioned buyer, um, unfortunately, start to accrue. We've been at full capacity the last two or three weeks. And I think part of that is potentially just because of people finding difficulty in getting properties bought. And I think they're thinking, yep. this is too hard. I'm just going to outsource it to a buyer's agent. Of course, it's not that much easier for us at the moment because <laughs> stock levels have been so tight, especially in southeast Queensland and Brisbane. Um quality stock has not been easy to come by so yeah we're getting a steady flow of clients through but it's just not that easy to get stuff bought quickly so yeah it's definitely interesting and i've had a few people come to me for 
uh, just strategic reviews, I guess. You know, they're thinking about what comes next. It's been a, such a, an up and down two or three years that a few people are just looking for uh, some guidance on where to go next. Um, so let's rip into this three uh, new stories of the week. Um, so the big three stories we're going to cover this week. Firstly, uh, Australia's home ownership rate has fallen since the peak in 1966. Comsec put out an infographic this week. And um, it's interesting that home ownership rates have just bounced up a little bit since the last census, but probably in a downtrend overall. So we'll take a bit of a look there at what's going on. Uh, PEX uh, came out, second news story, uh, where property demand is set to soar. It's covered by the Fin Review. Um, making uh, the case for some big population growth figures over the next couple of decades, taking the Aussie population up to 35 million by 2046 or thereabouts. And they've done some analysis on where population growth is expected to be strongest. Pretty interesting stuff. And then thirdly, an interesting uh, story, Harry, Harry Triggerboff pleads for no rate hike as insolvency soar. That was a piece in The Australian. But since that piece came out, we've had the inflation figures for the September quarter Came in a bit spicy, uh, a little bit hotter than expected by uh, market, um, well, the economists in the market. So a lot of chatter now about the potential interest rate hike on Melbourne Cup Day. So Harry may not get his wish. So uh, Chris, uh, looking forward to ripping through those three. Yeah, let's get stuck into the home ownership rate. It's a, it's a big conversation, this, and um, I guess there's two ways you can look at it. What, what did the story say? So Comsec um, put together the info graphics. So Australia's home ownership rate is now around 63%, which roughly puts it on a par with uh, my neck of the woods, the United Kingdom, also uh, the UK and Canada. It's a very much, uh, much of a muchness for those nations. In fact, very, very similar home ownership rates across all of those areas. There's always some outlier uh, countries when you look at this stuff. Um, top of the tree was Kosovo, nearly 100% home ownership rates in Russia, Singapore, uh, so there are some markets where you get very high home ownership rates, usually with uh, some level of uh, government intervention. But Australia is kind of in the pack, I suppose. Uh, New Zealand's a bit lower again uh, than Australia. Um, but interestingly, if you go back to 1966, that was the peak home ownership rates in Australia, 74%. Uh, there was a big push um, after the Second World War to get houses built and get people into them. Uh, but in recent years, we've seen very high rates of immigration and most people tend to rent initially i think around about 30 percent of aussies were born overseas including myself um and if you include uh people with a foreign-born parent well it's over half of australians so it seems that um despite a recent rebound which i guess was driven by the government's stimulus packages and first home buyer grants it the general trend seems to be down and i guess if you're looking further out, probably Sydney and Melbourne would be drifting down towards 50%. What do you reckon? Yeah, and I guess it's, um, you know, ultimately a lot of those people would want to buy, you know, the, as the home ownership rate falls, that means less people are owning property and, yes, they're forced to rent. But a lot of those would like to stay in rental accommodation, you know, because they're, it suits their life and, you know, they haven't got a desire to own a home. But, you know, when you're in a rental crisis, you um, and you've got very short-term leases, a lot of them would want to own a home. And I think a low home ownership rate basically shows how much pent-up demand there is in the property market. You know, how many people would love to uh, buy a property but aren't able to do that um, so far or haven't prioritised it, you know, and or haven't had the means to do it. And so when you've got government policies like 5% deposits, you know, um, that is really what um, encourages those people to enter the market. If they don't have a deposit hurdle and they've got the income, then they can buy, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I actually see it as a, as a sign for future property demand. Then we can talk about other things that, you know, increase property demand, which would be, you know, uh, migration and things like that. But And then just demographics, you know, people who, you know, didn't really want to own a home because they're 16 right now, but when they're, you know, 25 or 30, they do want to own something as well. So you've got that demographic trend as well. So um, obviously it's not ideal. I mean, you can see on that list as well that um, Singapore is, you know, 80 90%. I mean, they basically do subsidise housing for, um, you know, basically first home buyers. They get to buy a property well under market price. The, the government gives them one chance of entering the market and that's a model that's starting to get more and more airwaves in Australia. I know Carlos Cacho put in some reports. We did a um, uh, Murray, what's his name, uh, Cameron Murray uh, 
you know, has done a lot of research on this sort of Singapore housing model and is that something that we could be using in Australia? And so, um, yeah, I think that's where we're heading. We're heading into, you know, government intervention more and more for first home buyers. And um, and if we can increase first home buyers into the market, then, you know, we, we create more stability and security in, in our Australian economy. I think you're right. If you dip into the census figures, uh, if you went back um, to the turn of the century, the median age of a first-time buyer was about 24, and now it's 34. So in a relatively short space of time through the mining construction boom and then the, the resources export boom and then the population boom that kind of rolled on from that, we've seen, well, roughly speaking, the median age of a first-time buyer has increased by about a decade, 10 years. Um, so that's definitely one significant change i mean so people are still wanting to buy but often it's taking them longer to uh, to get around to it um, and another interesting trend from the census if you went back to the mid 1990s about 40 percent of homes were owned outright now that that figure has dropped to about 30 so there's definitely more mortgage debt against housing i mean i wonder whether th there might be more people taking debt into their retirement years now um chris as people have a a sort of a better understanding of how uh, debt tends to get inflated away over time. And I guess people have done very well from property over that kind of time period wouldn't be too fearful of having a little bit of mortgage debt. But I think generally the, the, the trends do show that, yes, that it's that younger cohort, uh, sort of 18 to 34, where home ownership rates have dropped away. And um, it's only really been um, there's only really been a rebound in recent years, partly because of those those first time owners grants that they put into place. Yeah, I mean, holding debt into retirement, I think that's going to happen more and more. I think people are going to have the, the view that, you know, because putting money into your super versus paying off your mortgage is, is not a bad strategy. And it's something, you know, sometimes people should consider, um, not financial advice, but that's something. Um, I mean, extending loan terms, I, I could easily see 40 years or even 50 year mortgages coming out in the next, you know, five to 10 years. There's already 40 year mortgages on the market now. Um, and so, um, that is going to be a way, and when you talk about someone in their 30s, a 50-year mortgage is going to absolutely take them into retirement. I think um, people uh, ha will have the view that, okay, well, I'll take in 500 grand of debt into retirement, but then I'll downsize um, because the kids have left home. I won't need that space, and um, that's better than not entering the market now. And um, or you know, so I, I do think you know that's going to happen more and more. But I also think, you know, uh, on the contrary to that, is that People are going to get stuck in their homes more and more. And people are going to, um, even though they have the desire to upgrade, you know, they might be in their 40s and they'd love a bigger house because the kids are getting to the teenage years. But instead of making, uh, you know, upgrading and typically getting that, you know, four bedroom house and the bigger house, the jump into that property is just too big. And I think that a lot of people will just make it work. You know, they'll, they'll go, well, We'd love to upgrade and um, have a bigger house, but we can't because the jump's too big and I've got to pay stamp duty and selling costs. We're just going to have to make it work in this smaller house. And by doing so, they're not going to increase their debt levels um, and that's going to potentially give them a lower mortgage than being at upgrading because they just, the table, the option was just taken off the table. And so they haven't, not going to take on that additional debt um, because they just can't afford to, to make that jump because it's an extra million dollars to do so. So, you know, I think it's, yeah, overall, I do see that there's going to be a lot more debt in the system secured by properties. People aren't just going to be able to buy a house and pay it off quickly um, like they were able to do in the 80s and 90s. I think um, you're right. I think there was a 40-year product being pushed by one of the non-bank lenders only this week. I think you had to service for a 30-year loan, but it was over a 40-year term. So you can see the way yep. the trend is going there. I think um, reverse mortgages for people in retirement, they haven't been very popular in Australia, I believe, because of capital requirements and regulations make it difficult. But um, I think, yeah, just generally people are not in a rush to pay back the debt. Certainly they weren't when interest rates were stuck at zero, uh, but maybe just a bit more appetite to take debt um, longer and deeper into the journey than used to be the case. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. We'll have to see where home ownership rates get to for the next census um, and definitely watch that one with interest. So, Chris, second story where property demand is... Just to finish that one off, Pete, so Brian Hart's uh, ex-CEO of Westpac, um, you know, he basically killed reverse mortgages when he was in the banks. When he left CEO in the banks, he opened up a reverse mortgage product called 2B. Um, and I've interviewed him before, I have many a chats with him. And um, 
I, I can see the reverse mortgage market. The government's already um, offers a, the government backed reverse mortgage sort of solution now. And I can see these things um, really coming into the market more and more. And, um, you know, his product, for example, is trying to go for international um, capital, you know, so international super funds who want a, an income producing investment. Um, that uh, And there's a lot of money in the systems, a lot of pension funds around the world that would like just a solid, steady um, return on their money secured and backed by Australian residential property at low LVRs. It's a pretty good little bet. And so I can see reverse mortgages um, coming out more and more over the years with, with product innovation, um, particularly with international money. So, yeah, it's it's home ownership rate. I think you can look at it two ways. Yeah, there's a lot of people who aren't able to buy. Well, do they want to buy? Yes. Okay, well, that's future demand. That's things that will support prices long term when they've got the ability to buy, whether they save more government intervention, higher incomes, family inheritance, all of these things, you know, um, get passed down. So what's story two, Pete? I think it's one of the things that does create so much angst is that most people actually do ultimately want to own property, especially at a time when the rental market is so tight. I think it's um, something that most Aussies still aspire to. So, yeah, second News story of the week where property demand is set to soar, covered in the Fin Review by Nyla Sweeney. Um, it was a report from PEXA. So the population is expected to spike by 7.4 million or so in 20 years, particularly in the four most populous states, and we're not building enough homes. So Victoria's population expected to grow by 2 million people. New South Wales, 1.7 million. Queensland, 1.6. And I think when you actually drill down into the numbers, uh, Greater Melbourne around 1.6 million of that growth, uh, Sydney about 1.2 million, and Brisbane and Perth near enough 1 million each. And I think um, it's interesting because populations are going to grow by that much. Uh, where are the areas within the cities that are going to actually see the population growth? Well, for Melbourne, it's the outer west, the southeast, and partly inner city with more apartments being built, which will see the strongest population growth. Um, so, I mean, that, those are big, big numbers. And th this is um, coming at a time uh, when the Labor government has made a, a sort of a statement saying we want to build 1.2 million homes over five years. But it's, well, it's, it's just not happening at the moment. So we're seeing a building approvals are, have slumped away to decade lows. Um, housing starts have fallen to decade lows. Completions have done the same. Um, so, yeah, interesting to see where demand is expected to soar, but it's quite sobering in the context of very, very slow housing supply at the moment. Well, I mean, I just did a quick look. So 1.67 million in New South Wales, for example. I think Newcastle's 450,000. I think Wollongong similar. Um, I mean, Canberra is not, probably not too far off that as well, right? So if you put those three together, that's roughly... Um, what is going to be needed so we're basically going to create a newcastle a canberra and a wollongong in new south wales and so you know where we get we're not going to uh, and where do we the job hubs would likely be sydney right you know um and so i i see that whole newcastle all the way down past wollongong to the south coast um to basically you know be more interconnected and connect uh and and that's really where the hybrid work will be part of this solution, I believe. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of new housing. And, you know, you can build, yes, you can build greenfield estates, but, you know, there is challenges in doing so in terms of the land could be flood land or just the whole infrastructure requirement. Or do we, you know, get faster rail? But ultimately, it's a huge number. And, you know, we've got 500,000 people who have come here this year alone. Um, and you know, I can't see the population growth slowing down, to be honest. I think it's one of the things that drives our economy. It's interesting, actually. The, if you take the most recent few months of population growth and annualise it, it looks like immigration is running at, well, dare I say, over 550,000 per annum. Now, surely it's got to slow down at some point, but that is really unprecedented stuff. Um, so, yes, it's and partly driven by the the rebound in international students and temporary visas over the past year. But it's it's really big numbers. And we're starting to see that again in rental vacancies. CoreLogic uh, reported this week um, their rental vacancies in the capital cities, the lowest ever on record. So, yes, yeah, so in terms of where population growth um, in Sydney, suburbs in the southwest, also 
Blacktown and Parramatta in the inner city and the inner city are predicted to rack up the strongest population growth. So that kind of makes sense. I think the the sort of more medium and higher density markets and I guess housing supply could be built in Riverstone, Penrith, Leppington, Campbelltown, Parramatta and Sydney City. So, yes, there's definitely some parts of the city out to the outer west and outer southwest where you could get some greenfield estates. But a lot of this is going to need to be units, townhouses, duplexes, that kind of supply. Um, but, yeah, it's just a, enormous numbers because um, essentially for every half a million people, you need a quarter of a million dwellings, roughly speaking. And, um Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to even envisage how Sydney might look with those kind of additional numbers over the next 20 years. But uh, if the Aussie population is going to 35 million by 2046, that's what's going to have to be. Yeah, and I think it's just um, what it means is the city is going to change a lot. And I guess when you own a property, you want to own something that as the city changes, your property doesn't usually. It becomes a little sanctuary, a little protected zone, a little... Um, I don't know, a little, uh, you know, a little pocket, I guess, a little that, you know, while the city's getting busier and busier and this little pocket sort of stays the same. It's like tree-lined streets. It's got a cute, like, heritage feel and um, it's like a sanctuary. And if you can get that, I think that's something that will stay really desirable. And so I think what you want to do is whenever you're buying property and you got a whole property over the longer term is you – you want to be very careful where you buy and what street and what's it's backing onto and is it too close to the train station where it's going to be the land that's first targeted for rezoning and because I think zoning is going to change a lot. But I think if you are careful about where you buy and what you buy, I think you can protect yourself from this. And, you know, like what that wins, for example, um, you know, a lot over the city, they are knocking down houses, um, you know, rows of houses, you know. I just saw one in Bondi, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So it was six houses or seven houses bought for $20 million by a developer um, and they're going to build a six-level high-rise on it. So that's seven houses less in Bondi. Uh, but, you know, and so you could be careful if you own a house in Bondi, well, you've got seven less available, right? So that's great for your long-term prices because supply is drying up. So, yeah, you just got to be really careful knowing that the cities are going to have to change as our populations grow. Um but can you own in a little sanctuary, you know? Green tree cover is one of the good things that, you know, people are unlikely to go and knock down hundreds and hundreds of trees. So if your area is very leafy, that's that's going to give you better protection, you know, particularly with climate change, right? Um, and there's lots of other things you can do to, you know, lower that risk. Yeah, that's right, Chris. And, um, well, yeah, I mean, even just thinking back to the changes over the past 20 years, you know, it's, it's going to be the same again over the next couple of decades. And, uh yeah, enormous changes. And we certainly thought in the last cycle, oh, there didn't seem to be anywhere to build in Sydney. And yet developers find, uh, when the demand is there anyway, uh, developers find places to build. Um, so let's have a look at this third new story of the week, because this is the big one, I guess, Chris. So uh, the Australian reported Triggerboff pleads for no rate hike. So uh, we got some figures out over the past couple of weeks. 783 insolvencies across the construction sector in the third quarter. That's a 27% jump. Um, and there's more coming in October. We saw just over the past week, Dome Group. There was another one this week. And what Triggerboff was saying in the article, um, he's saying foreign developers are quitting Australia, Country Garden, Rizland, Greenland, Yuhu, Dalian Wonder and Polly. Um, so um, obviously China, uh, Country Garden has been in default to put some of its Sydney projects on the market and selling a big housing estate in Melbourne. Uh, Rizland has also started pulling out and a number of others. And what Triggerboff was saying is that um, even the talk of a further interest rate hike is spooking confidence in the market. And uh, we already know, I mean, construction insolvencies are the highest we've seen across the data series over the past decade. And um, if fewer people are going to buy a new apartment, which would be very understandable in the current environment. Well, that's going to be terrible for cash flow uh, for developers who are already teetering on the precipice. And in fact, ABC News did a piece this week saying that there's a number of builders been accused of trading insolvent but not disclosing that to uh, prospective buyers. And it's causing all kinds of problems in the market. Now, that's the backdrop. And then we got the inflation figures this week, which came in higher than expected. So 1.2% for the September quarter, 5.4% over the year. So inflation has come down from 7.8% to 
at the beginning of the year to 5.4. And uh, I guess there's some big numbers to drop off next quarter, which will take us down to about 4.5% or thereabouts. But it's not as quick as the Reserve Bank was previously forecasting. They were hoping for inflation to be back down to around about 4% by the end of the year, and we're not going to get it. So huge debate. A um, number of economists are saying uh, the RBA shouldn't jump at shadows. We've got Stephen Koukoulis at Market Economics, so Terry McCran in the Australian arguing very strongly for no rate hike, also Deloitte Access Economics. But most economists are teetering or tilting now towards a Melbourne Cup Day interest rate hike, which has a whole range of implications, I guess, Chris, for the housing market. Yeah, I mean, uh, Triboff not, uh, not wanting to um, in higher interest rates, lower borrowing capacities um, to hit the apartment sector. I mean, He's sort of right in in some sense that, you know, I don't know whether people are really upset if Harry's not making money, right? Richest man in Australia and uh, especially the people in Green Square where, you know, linking back to our last report, I mean, Harry's trying to do an enormous development down in Green Square and he's basically just holding off, waiting for the council to give in to um, to allow that, which should completely change the, the, the suburb, um, to be honest. So, um, but I mean, it's not just you know Harry. You know, we're seeing Hutchies were in the paper yesterday. Um, Richard Crooks were in the the pay, AFR a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, like you said, Dome Group. You know, that that was a big established uh, mid tier sort of resi builder. You know, building two, three, four million dollar homes and um, had been around for a long, long time. And they went under. So um, it's really is you know, and these are these are jobs that people are losing. Um, it's you know, it's a lot of. And so it's a big hit to our economy every time builders are going under. And so I think they've had it tough for a few years, not just with higher interest rates, you know, the weather, materials, um, getting labour, um, you know, higher interest rates are killing them now as well, getting developer finance, et cetera. So we've been banging on this a bit. So Harry's known to get in the media and um, throw his weight around. I mean, higher interest rates, is it going to change things much? I don't know. I think there was a couple of interest rates in May and June, that did knock confidence from our borrowers. Now, if it's only going to be one more or potentially even two more, I do think it's going to create more pain. I don't think that that pain, you know, 50 basis points isn't going to be the, the tipping point that everyone rushes to sell. I think it does make things tighter for them. And, yeah, I mean, people may have to, you know, get bank help and things like that. But, you know, if it's likely still to then drop off because inflation is going the wrong, right direction, and it's just a little bit extra pain. I mean, the higher it goes up, probably the harder it's going to fall as well. So, you know, if it goes up some, um, you know, 4.1, it goes up to 4.6, well, we're probably going to get rate cuts sooner, right? And, you know, that confidence that rate cuts are here and rate cuts are happening um, could be earlier than if we just stay at 4.1. So there's, there's the potentially a psychology thing here, you know, rates go up and then potentially now it's talk of rate cuts. Well, maybe just that, that confidence of rate cuts are here could be stimulating the market. And so I wouldn't be too concerned about this one or two rate increases. I don't think it's going to deter buyers. Um, I, I potentially, if anything, it actually means less stock coming on the market because people think, hang on a sec, do I really want to sell right now, um, you know, and take on more debt, you know, because you need people upgrading and transacting. And so a lot of, you know, will just say, well, actually, you know what, I'm just going to hold on to know where rates finally end up and when rate cuts are coming, that'll give me the confidence to sell my property and buy another one. Because um, most people are increasing their debt when they're selling, not reducing. And a lot of downsizers just can't find suitable accommodation. They're just There's not enough options for them to downsize into, so they want to hold off downsizing. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not too concerned around this sort of, you know, should they hike, should they not hike? I think it's a bit of a non-event in the marketplace. Um, it won't affect borrowing capacities too much, you know, 25 or 5%. It's not going to change buyers' budgets by much. It was interesting. I was chatting to um, my uh, buyer's agent colleagues and um, my colleague Andrew up in Brisbane, he just said, bring it on. He said, that we need things to slow down. It's been hectic um, <clears throat> over recent months. So he... He was uh, more of the opinion, just get it done. If they need to hike again, just just get on with it. Um, interesting to take a look at the biggest contributors to the September quarter inflation. Um, so by far and away, the biggest contrib contribution came from auto fuel. So basically petrol prices, 0.34 uh, percentage points. So big, I mean, that's a 7.5% increase in fuel prices over the past quarter. Nothing that interest rates will impact. This is obviously driven by international um, dynamics and uh, pressures 
overseas. So nothing really there that interest rates are going to do. Uh, the second biggest contribution came from rents. Well, as we've already touched on, I think if we've got a whole range of developers already teetering on the precipice of extinction, well, any further tightening is just going to knock them over. Um, so that's probably, if anything, uh, going to make the rental crisis worse than it already is. Um, third biggest contribution was also from housing, new dwelling purchase. Um, so basically, the cost of new housing was up 1.3%. Uh, that was a bit more than I would have thought, Chris. But uh, I think if you like, if you went back to last year, um, new dwelling uh, purchase costs were up over twenty percent year on year. They were absolutely going bananas, and it, it does seem, from what I'm hearing around the traps, that in real time those cost pressures are, are falling away. And then the fourth biggest contribution was from electricity, which again we can't really blame. Uh, you know, we've got no one to blame us but ourselves on that. So it's a policy failure, really. Electricity prices would have been up over 30% over the year if it wasn't for government subsidies. So, uh, I mean, that probably is probably a function of very high population growth and, and a bit of a market failure. But, yeah, I mean, if, when you look at those contributions to inflation, um, and, uh, interest rates aren't going to make a big difference to some of those, arguably. I suppose the concern is that... Um, if the RBA is seen to be too lax, then um, inflation expectations could get embedded. And I must admit, if I was the new governor and it was me, I would just hike on Melbourne Cup Day and say, look, the last guy didn't get the job done. Uh, here's a hike and we'll do whatever it takes to get inflation back to target bang. That's what I would do, but um, we'll have to wait and see on the Melbourne Cup Day. Yeah, I mean, time will tell. I think ultimately, I don't think I'd be delaying my decisions really as a buyer, like trying to... Because if you delay, you could delay it four months. You know, November, December, very little listings start hitting the market in December. We may be a bit more than usual. January will be pretty quiet. I think agents definitely sort of, and, and solicitors in as well. You know, like that's the thing. It's not just the agents. They need the, the conveyances and the lawyers around to set up the contracts. They need their trades to, you know, um, you know get their houses ready for sale. They need the stylists. There's a whole system behind the real estate market. And, you know, generally, is, you know, so even if the agent wants to work, can they get the tradie there? Can they get the stylist there? Um, can they get the, the photographer? There's usually not that many photographers that, um, you know, photograph these properties or they've got relationships with a few. So, you know, I think you'll find that January is really quiet. And then people are a bit nervous being the first property to list in the start of February. Ultimately, people want to see a few sales. Um, and so then they usually list their properties late Feb. So usually, you know, from my experience, Peter, if you line up as well, you know, early Feb's a little bit, you know, everyone's overexcited. There's a lot of buyers in the market and there's usually quite, you know, all the old stocks being bought up in December and January. Um, and then this new stock comes on and then and, and then but the new sellers try to figure out. That it doesn't rush to the market. People just see what happens and then they start selling. Is that what you usually see in February, Pete? Yes, it's. I think particularly in Queensland, you see a lot of people go away over that Christmas, New Year period, um, sometimes to get away from the heat in Brisbane. Uh, but yeah, things can be pretty slow to get up and running. It's not such a big auction market, of course, in Brisbane. So uh, things can generally be a bit slow to get up and running. And But likewise in Sydney and Melbourne, as you say, it takes a bit of time for uh, things to hit their straps again. I was just um, interested to note there, because your point about if interest rates go up faster, they come, may come down quicker as well. Uh, Bank of Canada kept interest rates on hold today, and it looks like uh, they're expecting 150 basis points of cuts next year. I don't think we'll see that in Australia necessarily, but if you look at Australia's three-year bond yield, um, so the government bond, which is, I guess, a key funding benchmark in this country, uh, the three-year bond yield is back to 4.25%, which is essentially where it was uh early in July, so about four months ago. So uh, we sort of saw the yield falling down a bit. Now it's come back up. It's retesting those highs. But it, there's not a huge change, I guess, over the past four months in medium-term expectations for interest rates. So, yes, mm -hmm. in the short term, definitely a knock to confidence and it'll push more people into arrears. I'm sure that we, we're going to see. I mean, the winter period is never good for developers anyway, um, but if there's a further knock to confidence, yeah, for sure, more insolvencies there, which will keep the rental market tight. Um, but, yeah, so I think for a lot of borrowers, it might just be a case of hanging in there and tightening the belts over the Christmas period, not spending so much. Yeah, I mean, time will tell on this, Pete. I think ultimately, 
the next few months. You just got to be in the market. You know, be very patient and persistent, and wait for quality. I think that's the challenge here. Um, not everything's selling. You know, this is really almost a two-speed market. You know, you speak to an agent that's got not great stuff to sell. Um, unfortunately, they say we can't get anything sold. Times are tough. Then you talk to the top dog um, in the age in the area, and they're selling stuff, right? Because they're getting the better listings. And so, I think there is a bit of a two-speed market depending on the agent you talk to, and depending on the type of properties they get access to sell. Sure is. Uh, so, just to recap, uh, three news stories of the week: Australia's home ownership rate certainly lower than in 1966, has rebounded a little bit. So interesting trends to watch as the census comes around. Uh, property demand set to soar over the next two decades, says PEXA, and they gave us some examples of where and what type of property to look out for. And then thirdly, Harry Triggerboff pleads for no rate hike as insolvency soar across the sector, uh, but the inflation figures uh, seem to have other ideas. So um, we'll uh, stay tuned for Melbourne Cup Day, Chris, and uh, we may well have uh, some excitement on that day, as we usually do seem to get in Australia with Reserve Bank decisions. Um, so I think that's about it for uh, this week. Um, you can catch me at Pete Wardgen Blogspot. That's my daily blog. Or at Pete Wardgen on Twitter. And uh, Chris, I'm sure you're going to let people know where they can catch you. Yeah, reach out in the show notes. I'm more than happy to chat to anyone. We've spoken to hundreds of um, listeners to the podcast now. So absolutely would love to uh, meet you and see how we can help you think through your decisions. Wish you all a great week and happy Sunday. Beautiful. Thanks, Chris. Cheers.